for us, not against us, and provide a future and a hope. Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, uh, Lord, that we would spend that future with you, Lord. And as we get into your word now, Lord, I pray that you would do your work in each heart that's here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Take a minute and say good morning once again to each other. Kids, you are this Hold on, hold on, real quick. Hold on. Hold on. I just want to take a picture because I think it's, it's, it's so cool to see everyone here. And I, the worship was really inspiring. I heard everyone sing. Yeah, this is, a, this is something I want to remember. So hang on. We get off myself. Okay. All right, ready? Hey, hey, Say Jesus, one, two, three. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. All right, children. Yeah. Hogwarts. Hogwarts. Yeah. He says it were perfect. Hogwarts. Ha ha ha. Give me five. Ooh, wow. That was good. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. Good to see you. So excited to see you guys. Um, just this wonderful day when we gather together, the saints come together and give praise and worship. I, I just think of what it'll be like when we get to heaven and what a glorious time it'll be as we're filled with the train and the, of his glory and his majesty and, and we're singing him the praises due his name. And every heart is, is clean before him and seen before him and known as you are known. And there's no more... Um, hidden agendas or anything whatsoever, just pure love, and, and what a glorious time it's going to be. And as we're, um, we're going into today's message, uh, I, I entitled it, Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover, and, and so many of you, maybe you know this, maybe some of you don't know this, maybe it's obvious, but I cut my own hair. Um, so I've been doing this for several years now, and uh, normally I like to use an eight all around and then threes on the side and just kind of, it, yeah, it's, it's one of those things from uh, my military past. I just like it high and tight kind of. But uh, no, I didn't join the military this time. I know it's shorter than normal. Uh, but what ended up happening is I'm talking to Lisa while I'm cheating and I saw there were a few out, out of uh, place and I said, my OCD said those got to go. Well, I had the wrong clipper on. So I, the back top, so to make a long story short, I went high and tight. So, <laughs> so, so some of you might think I'm ready to join the military, but I'm already in the military. I'm in the Lord's military, and I'm doing his work. So um, don't judge a book by its cover <laughs> is the point. Don't judge a book by its cover. Um, I went out on, on uh, LinkedIn, and I saw this, this story that I thought was funny, that applies to not judging a book by its cover. Um, there was an old lady who handed a check to a bank teller and said, I would like to withdraw $500. The female teller told her, for withdrawal less than $5,000, please use the ATM. The old lady then asked why. Then the teller um, irritably told her, these, rule, these are the rules, please leave if you, if you have other than that, this matter. There are there's a queue of people behind you. So then return if uh, then she returned the card to the old lady. And the old lady remained silent, but she returned the check to the teller and said, "Please help me withdraw all my money that I have." And then the teller was astonished when she checked the account balance. She nodded her head, leaned down, and said to the old lady, "My apologies, Granny." You have 3.5 billion in your account, and your bank account does, and our bank does not have uh, that much currency on hand. Could you make an appointment to come in tomorrow? The old lady asked, "How much am I available to withdraw right now?" And the teller told her, "Any amount up to 300,000." So the old lady said to the teller, she wanted to withdraw 300,000 from her account. The teller did so quickly and handed the old lady respectfully. The old lady kept 500 in her bag and asked the teller to deposit the balance of $299,500 into the account. And the teller was dumbfounded. The moral is don't judge a book by its cover. She thought this was a helpless little old lady, but this was a very shrewd businesswoman <laughs> who knew what she was doing. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, so. So as we get into the scriptures today, we're seeing that there's a judgment that the Pharisees would have on all mankind. And these are learned people who knew the word of God and considered themselves uh, the, the, the heritage of God's chosen people. And, and Paul knew this. And Paul had to tear down these pillars, if you would, of their foundation, if he was ever going to get them to see the gospel. And also if he was ever going to get this division that was between the Gentiles and the Jews. 
removed so that we would be a church in one accord. And so Romans, we're going to be going through the book of Romans chapter 2, verse 11 through 29. But um, John chapter 7, verse 24 says this. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. In other words, don't look on the countenance of the people, but continue, God said, even as you're teaching the word of God, keep giving truth. Don't look and see someone's rolling their eyes, they're bored, they're this, they're receiving, they're not receiving. Preach truth to the rich, the poor, the, those that seem knowledgeable, those that seem not so knowledgeable. It doesn't matter. It stays stay the course. And, and as, as my brother was saying, you know, let's be real. Not necessarily real like, oh, woe is me. I, I'm fasting. Can you see it on my face? I mean, that's the truth. When you fast, you're hungry, man. I don't know if any of you have ever fasted, but you can get withdrawn. But the Lord says, no, don't act like that. Because the whole purpose is that you're drawn close to God. Amen? So at any moment, no matter where you are in life, you can be filled with joy. With a moment. With a decision to look to God instead of on your problem. Amen? And that's the beautiful thing. But, but there is a pretense. There are pretenders. There are those out there walking piously or above everyone else, looking down their nose at others and judging them based on their own decisions of what's important and what's not important. And this is exactly what was happening in the Bible um, as we get into our scripture verses, beginning in Romans chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to start off. For there is no respect of persons with God. Starts off right off the bat. As, as, uh, Paul, as uh, Paul's been talking to them and talking about these wicked sins that the Gentiles are doing all around. And then he goes in and he starts to rebuke the law that the Pharisees are saying they're keeping. And he starts rebuking what they're saying they're doing when they're really not doing it. They're heretics. They're, they're hypocrites. And there's really not much worse, as we're going to see in this study, that, that angers the Lord than a hypocrite. One that says something but does another. And so he says he's not a respecter of persons. Matthew chapter 25, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 says this, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on evil and on good, and sendeth the rain to the just and the unjust. Right? Everybody got up today, the sun's still up there heating the whole earth. Whether there's wicked people on the earth or whether there's good people on the earth, it rains, when it rains, if we go out, don't we all get wet? It's still raining on the just and the unjust. It's the same for every human. God is fair and just. Even, even Christians, some Christians come to Christ and say, Well, I thought it was all going to be perfect, roses, and, and everything. It is. If you keep your eyes on the Lord, you have a different perspective. But you're still going through this world, aren't we? This cursed world. We all still have trials and tribulations, but we can be of good cheer. Verse 12, as we continue on in our scripture verses, says this, For as many as, we, as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law are justified. Just as we are justified by walking in faith, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 38. But James chapter 2, 18 is telling us that, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I, and, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. If is not, is not that uh, what we say or how we appear, but what we do that matters in revealing who's our God, who's our Lord, right? It's not just I say all the right things and I walk around and I do something completely different. It, I'm here on Sunday and we put on our smiley faces and we put on our uh, everything we're, we're excited to learn and be with God, but then we walk out the door and, okay, Lord, I got my own agenda. Thank you. I did my check mark of doing what you've asked me to do. <laughs> right? And then we're not here. We're just hearers of the word, but not doers of the word. The Bible says it's like looking in that mirror and seeing something wrong with you as God shows you in the scriptures and then walking away with a big piece of spinach on your teeth and, you know, and, and smiling at everyone when you still got spinach in your teeth that God's telling you, hey, you got a little something there. Um, so, <laughs> sorry about that. I heard someone talking. Well, what, what we do matters and it's, <clears throat> if it's out of the heart that the abundance of the mouth speaks in Matthew 12, verse 34, it says, and Luke um, 6, 
verse 45 goes a little bit more in depth than that. He says, A good man out of good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, but an evil man out of the treasure of his heart will bringeth forth that which is evil. For, uh, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So how do we know where our hearts are? Right? The Lord says that, 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 that it, we're, they're wickedly deceitful above all things. And who can understand it? It says in um, Jeremiah chapter 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So we think we know ourselves, and yet we're constantly doing things that are wrong and, and, and opposed to God. Our mouths speak sometimes. If we listen to our words and judge our own words, we can start to see where our heart really is, right? Wickedly deceitful. It's, it's at times we want to do the things that are right, and yet we fall away. This is honesty, right? This is being honest, as my brother was saying. Taking off the mask. I say one thing, but then when I'm bumped or the pressure's put on me, like a pipe, I burst. It comes to the surface and blah! <laughs> That's my heart. That's where the treasure is. And so, why is Paul saying this? He's exposing um, the, the, the hypocrisy that's in the hearts of the Pharisees. They say a lot of things and they walk around. The Bible even talks about in Matthew chapter 6, he says, Be not like the Pharisees who stand on the street corners with their hands up, making prayers for everyone to see them. Look at how holy I am. Look at how pious I am. Look at the walk I do. He says, rather, go into your prayer closet where no man sees you and pray to your Father, and that's what's seen in secret will be, re will be revealed. The Lord knows already. Who are we trying to impress? Who are we trying to put in bondage because of our wicked hearts? Because we want to control things. Because we want to be God. We want to be on high. Be careful. It says in verse 14, as we continue on, in our scripture verses, it says, And when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are the law to themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the mean, while accusing or else excusing one another, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So, he's saying, what's worse? To go around preaching the Ten Commandments and having them memorized. Like, you know, we all try to memorize scripture, but why are we memorizing it? It's, it's supposed to be so that while we're in that battle, the Spirit of God will bring to remembrance those truths that can penetrate and empower us to glorify God. It's not so that we can impress all our friends. It's not so that we can walk around and quote all these scriptures and look like we're intellectual. That's not the purpose at all. As a matter of fact, the Bible is telling us that it's better that you don't have the scriptures memorized and you do them than it is to have them memorized and don't do them. Paul, once again, hitting right to the core of these, these Pharisees that are walking around, walking Bibles, if you will. And, you know, many of us know this, is that the Pharisees, in order to become a Pharisee, by the time they're 12, have the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, memorized. Ooh, it was hard enough for me to memorize all these other things as I was a kid. You know, some of the prayers, our Father, or our Heaven, you know, those, all the prayers that we all try to remember as little kids. I can't, I can't even imagine remembering word by word every dot and every tittle. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Where's your motive? Where's your intent? I got a, I went to Alpha and Omega the other day because um, someone in our church received the Bible and they said, uh, I want to know how to learn how to read the Bible. And I thought, maybe I'll find a brochure or something like that. And I started looking through some of these studies. And one of the ones I found that I really liked, the first thing it said on it, was here's, here's what you do and how to read the scriptures. And what is the reason we study the Bible? Mm -hmm. Say it again. No yeah, those who depend on the studies to me know the very first reason. We're studying to know God. Humbling ourselves before the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God Almighty Creator, and saying, teach me. You know, I don't know. I want to know. Amen? Amen? That's what it's all about. Any other motivation is heresy. It's heretic. It's you trying to promote yourself in God's position. Be God. You're not God. We're not God. There's one God. And his throne's taken. Paul has to hit this home with the Pharisees. And we may think this is a little harsh. We may think this is a little cruel. 
But no, this is a critical point in order to penetrate into them that they understand they're bankrupt. That they understand that the laws that they're putting on people, they're not keeping themselves. And God is coming down on them. His wrath, as it just said, he says, in the day of judgment, they'll be judged according to my gospel. He owns the gospel. Do you call it your gospel? We all know it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We know it's the story, the love story of our God who came down to save the world. We all know this. It's his story. It's his gospel he's supposed to preach throughout the world. But do you say, it's my gospel? Do you own it? Is it your gospel? When anyone comes to you preaching other lies and other teachings in another gospel in another way, do you say, no, 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 that's not my gospel. My gospel is Christ and Christ alone. That's who I stand on. Paul says, on my gospel, this is what you're going to be judged on, you Pharisees. This is what's going to come upon you. The judge of the law of love, the law of liberty, the law of faith that we talked about last week. That's what you're going to be judged on. Verse 17, it says, Behold, thou art called Jew, and rest in the law, and makest thou boast. Here he goes. He says, here's my accusation against you. As, as a lawyer, as an accuser, not an accuser of the brethren, but as, as, as one to tear down the foundations of their very um, core, their, their, their rock that they're standing on, which is shifty sand, he's saying, you have two pillars. Two pillars that you're justifying yourself on. You're making yourself justified. In other words, you can continue doing the sin you're doing because you have two things I have against you. One is that you, you're, you're saying that you're, um, sorry. You're saying that you're a Jew. You're saying that you're heritage. You're saying, I'm entitled to this. I have entitlement. My parents are rich and therefore I should be rich. I was watching Shark Tank the other day, and yeah, I watched Shark Tank. Yeah. And, and as I'm watching it, um, Mark Cuban was said, uh, I guess he was upset with Barbara Cocker because she, she said, I won't give money to rich kids. Your parents are rich. I'm here to help people who need help and who are poor. And, and um, a couple of the people on there, Robert said it, and, and Mark Cuban said, look, I have kids too. I'm a rich father, but I don't want my, my kids being judged because of that. I, don't want, I want them being treated equally. With everybody, I want them the same, and, and so that it, we don't we don't live on our on our fathers. Even some people will continue, and, and 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 let's flip this the other way. Some of us are struggling in sin issues, and we say, well, that's because my father or my mother had this issue. Uh, no, that's not going to hold water with God. Yes, the sins of a father, and the Bible says, are passed down from generation to generation, sometimes three generations, so forth. And we all know this. If your father's an alcoholic, for example, you're more likely to be an alcoholic. You should probably be careful. But that doesn't make you an alcoholic. Amen? Amen. You can choose who you are in Christ Jesus. Maybe if you didn't have the escape and the way out and the power to be a new creature in Christ, you could rest on that. But you don't have that. And these people on the flip side are trying to say we're, we're holy because our parents are, are, are the Jews. We're the chosen. The same, the same line can be said for someone who's a child of, of a pastor or a child of someone living in a church and they grow up in the church and they say, well, I'm saved just by de facto. No, you're not. You individually, each and every one of us, have to choose Christ. And you're accountable with what you do with the gospel can't say because my mom and dad are saved, I'm saved. Amen? We get to an age where God says, talk to me. Who do you choose? Every one of us. So these two pillars, he's going to start to tear down, and he's trying to expose, so they'll stop leaning on these. And it says uh, in Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus speaking to them, you hypocrites. Well did Elijah say and prophesy uh, of you, saying, These people draw nigh to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Whenever you see Jesus angry in the Bible, I mean, whenever you think of the Lord God Almighty, creator of all things, getting angry with you, I don't know about you, but I'm like, <laughs> It's God. I, I feel that way when the lightning bolt hits too close to my house. Like, what did I do? Did I get everything in order here? I automatically start thinking back to the cross, right? Lord, I'm saved by grace. You know, I'm saved by your fit, by your work, not my works. But they may may boast. And, right, the real truth of the gospel starts coming in. Right, <laughs> like when you're faced before the living, fearful God, 
There's no more lies or, or deceiving. You're certainly not going to stand on your own works. You're certainly not going to stand on, look at me and who I've been. Uh-uh. It better be on the blood of Christ and Christ alone, or there is no salvation. Matthew 23, verse 13 says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering in. Ugh. You know, you're not even going in the right place and you're stopping others from coming. You're going the wrong way. And you're coming against my children. That's a serious wrath that's coming for those. Jesus once again says, you hypocrites. You're play actors. You're pretenders. Matthew 3 verse 9 says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to to, of these stones, raise up children of Abraham. That kind of wipes that right out, right? I'm one of the multiple children of, it, of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob that we're learning about on Thursday. And I'm part of that lineage of those many generations and many kingdoms. And, and, and that's us. That's me. And, and right away, Jesus rebukes them. <laughs> and, and, and through the prophets, saying that God can call to a stone and raise up a child of Abraham. All those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are of your father of faith, Abraham. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that the tree of life, that Israel was broken off and the Gentiles were grafted in. It's a fascinating thing to see a grafting in of a fruit tree into another tree, isn't it? It's amazing. The Bible talks about fruit trees in heaven. And the flavor of some of these things that we're going to see. And it says there'll be one tree with multiple types of fruit on it. And we think, how could that possibly be? Because God can do anything. God can save a wretch. God can save to a rock, be a child, and boom, done. It's God. We're saved by God's mighty grace, God's mighty work that He has towards us. And how foolish it is for man to start to come up and think they've achieved something worthy of God. It's foolishness. It's not correct. As a matter of fact, you're lying. You're not on God's part. We're only on God's part because we enter into God. Amen? Through the door, he's open and says, come. Isaiah, let's continue on in verse um, 24. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 23. It says, And thou makest thou boast in the law, though breaking the law you dishonor God. He's saying you're, you're saying you're speaking on behalf of God, and you're saying you honor God, and you're saying you're his ambassador, or you're his priests, or you're his royal people to be a beacon to point all people to God, when you're the exact opposite of God. You're blaspheming God. You're really promoting the devil. You're really promoting hatred and the opposite. In verse 24, we go on and he says, For the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. That's, that's quoting a scripture from the Old Testament, as Paul would do sometimes, being a learned man he was, to point people and bring their knowledge back to the revelation of Jesus Christ. He would come with scriptures from the Old Testament, which would relate to them. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 52, verse 5, and says, and Now therefore... What have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? That they that rule over them may howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually, every day, is blasphemed. Right before the judgment of the flood, the Lord says, Always, continuously, in the hearts and minds of men, was wickedness. It says that in the end times, this will come to be again. Men have distorted me. Men have distorted my truth. Men have distorted the rules that I put in place and the things. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But they're not representatives of me. And they're falsely leading people astray. And the whole world is becoming callous to God. Rather than drawing near to him, they have religions that aren't drawing near to him. It's in their imaginations. They've created their own God. Listen, this goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, one, you may not have thought of it like this, but I want you to start thinking of it like this. It says, 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. We think, oh my God, when it's just saying something goofy, right? That's blasphemy of the Lord. You know, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Or someone says, Jesus, and they're saying it condescendingly. And we're saying, don't use the name of the Lord in vain. That's my God, and it's all true. You're right. It's glorious. It's like saying my mom's name was Patricia. Oh, Patricia! When I, when I slam my finger in the door, right? It's like, <laughs> it's stupid. You really think about it. But I am taking the name in vain. I'm using it without power to give glory to God, to point people to the mighty creator. I'm using it vainly, meaninglessly. But isn't it more worse? Isn't it much more worse to say you're a Christian and you're walking in truths of God and I'm doing those things that God's called me to do and then all of a sudden you go and you misrepresent God to those people around you? You're taking his name in vain. Aren't you? The name of God. You're saying I'm Christ-like, Christian. I'm an ambassador. But you're living like the devil. You're blaspheming his name. You're taking it in vain. We all can do it, can't we? And God says, I'm not going to hold, I'm going to hold you accountable. I won't hold you sinless for that. Why? Because God desires to pour upon you his glory, his might, his power, his love, and everything that brings you to point others to him, but also point you to him. And he can't keep, let you keep going in some line because then you're not looking at his power. It's not his love any longer. It's no longer him that's in you. It's as, as what happened with Jesus and, and Peter. Right after Peter was lifted up on high and called a rock, moments later, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> when he was going against Jesus' plan, going against the plan of the Father, they had Jesus crucified. Just that quick, it can happen to us, can it? Challenge your heart and say, am I blaspheming the name of God? Not just because I'm not saying, oh my God, or Jesus in an incorrect situation. These men were blaspheming God. And Paul was very strict and coming right to the heart of the matter. Matter of fact, that's exactly what was happening as he was cutting to the heart of the matter. We need our hearts, some of us, cut. We have hard, stubborn, mule-like, rock-like hearts. And we won't change, and we won't move, we won't budge, because we think we got it all up here, and we've managed it all, and we've got it all together. As long as I do this check, and I do that check, then I'm in balance, and I'm good. But every single one of us falls out of balance when our hearts are not open to the Lord God Almighty to come in and have his seat upon our throne, the throne of our hearts. Amen? Amen. It, it's got to be God in there governing us. It's got to be. I just told you. We just looked through the scriptures. God's not a liar. Our hearts are wickedly deceitful above all things. Who can know it? God. God can know it. We have to let God in. Let's go in. These next scripture verses from here all the way to the end are going to be about this circumcision. The Pharisees were all were circumcised. were Abraham's children. Abraham's children, by the age of 12, have to have their, actually, eight, eight days after birth, have to have this foreskin removed from the, their man's hearts and thrown. And this is called circumcision. And this is what identifies us as the children of Abraham. And, you know, you look on the outward side. If I have Christian tattooed on my arm and a cross, then I'm a Christian. Right? I wear a cross earrings. I wear a cross. I'm a Christian. Really? If it were that simple. If it were just that simple. God looks on the heart. God judges the heart of the matter. And these next scripture verses, Paul's hitting home to the Pharisees using circumcision as an example. We're going to read all the way through and then we'll expand upon it from 25 to the end of our scripture verses for today, 29. Beginning in verse 25, it says, For circumcision verily profit, profiteth, if thou keepeth the law. But if thou art a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made to uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keepeth righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and the circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is it 
one that is circumcision, which is outward of the flesh. But he that is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. A lot packed in there, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff I was going to go into. Um, what's the difference between um, laws and, and judgment and, and um, creeds and things that they had to keep with the Bible? And rather than watch the eyes of us over here, if anyone's interested in that, text me. I'll give you what I did in my studies. But the heart of the matter here is they were putting laws on people and they were bombing them people up with things that were meant to be heart matters. Even the temple that was built for the Jews and everything in its meticulous order and the measurements and the holy and the entrance of the, of the fellowship hall and the women's a corridor and all the beautiful gate and every part of this temple all the way leading up to the holiest of holies was supposed to be a representation of what was inwardly in heaven in God's heart. It literally is a study that's phenomenal if you look at that. God. The temple is God. And we're ushering people in. He's saying, come in. Come in to me. And in the holiest of holies was God's heart. Think about that. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12 through 16 says, And now Israel... What does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am com commanding to you this day for your good. Behold, the Lord your God belong, uh, belong heaven and heaven heavens and the earth and all that's in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all people, as you are this day, circumcise therefore the foreskins of your heart and be no more longer stubborn. They should know the scripture verse, right? They have them all memorized. They are boasting on the half heart were the heirs of God, were the children of God. But what does he tell them? This I have against you. Your hearts are hardened. Your hearts have not welcomed me in. And, you, and, and, and by the way, you haven't entered into my heart, which I finally opened for you. You see, in the temple, there is a veil back then. A huge veil. And only one person, the high priest, was able to go into the holiest of holies once a year to sprinkle a few little bloods as a propitiation or a temporary covering, sacrifice, representation of the sins and the covering the blood necessary to pay for that death, a life where sin is, it requires a, a, a life. And so they dropped a few bloods and, and, and the priest had to go all, through all kinds of sacraments to make sure he was holy and clean and, and was in, even with bells on him so that, with a rope going through the veil so that if something happens, people can pull his dead body out. If he dies, he goes before the Lord, not right. And he's got bells on him, so they can hear him. <laughs> this is what would have to happen once a year. This was how it was, and this was a foreshadow. But we did, we do have a high priest who's now ripped that veil and says, Come all you to the Father God. Enter into my heart. We, God has never, ever asked us to do anything hasn't already done for us. Is it your gospel? Are you judging yourself by your merits, your degrees? I'm a doctor. I'm a theologian. I'm a pastor. I'm all this stuff. Have you believed your own lies? Have you started to puff yourself up and believe that your salvation and your walk and your power are in you? And who you are outwardly? Are you beating yourself up because you're comparing yourself to those you think are important? The President of the United States, the Governor, will you name it? What are you doing? Your salvation is in God. A gift, freely, by the one who's ripped that veil so that we all, as his priests, as his children, can come so much so 
that we can jump on his lap and say, Abba, Father, Daddy. Woo! Are you feeling it? Woo! Woo! Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 This is the gospel, people. This is the good news we have in Jesus Christ. We're going to go to communion right now. A communion that has been provided to us because of God Almighty. A communion meaning where two become one as we sup together, we sup with God Almighty, and we take hold of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in obedience to the Father as he broke his heart open for all of us. Whatever's in your mind, guys, whatever's going on right now, take it to the Lord as you get the, as you get the bread and you get the juice. I want you to bow your heads. I want you to pray. If people have been condemning you, rebuke them in the name of, in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have to go outwardly and rebuke them like Paul's doing here. Sometimes that's necessary. They're the ones dragging people out in their sin. Amen? Amen. And so Paul says, what you do now, you're being drug out. Now let me call you. This foundation you built your whole life on, your righteousness, is garbage, rubbish. Come. Sometimes we need that foundation knocked out from under us so we can get stronger. Amen? So when the liars come accusing, we can walk away with peace in our mind and we don't return evil for evil. We give love. And we just feel sorry for them. And if they will receive, we'll give them the truth of Jesus Christ. So bow your heads, pray. We'll pray in a little bit for the bread, and then we'll pray for the juice as well after that. But I want to give you guys time to pray. Yeah. Ask forgiveness if it's needed.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch that we have once was lost, but now we found was life, but now I see. was great. That's all my heart to fear and breaks my fears freely. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. Oh